for the opening remarks and introduction of our guest speaker by the Executive Director of the Center for Political and Democratic Reform, Incorporated, Dr. Clarita R. Carlos. Welcome you to the uh, tri-sponsored uh, symposium on defining Philippine baselines. Um, I'd like to thank first uh, our chairman and the former student, Professor Ruth uh, Mysterio Agrico, for agreeing to co-sponsor this very important uh, symposium. And also the director, uh, also former student. Everyone has been my former student. <laughs> Dr. Della uh, Atienza of the Third World Study Center, the top country there, for agreeing to cooperate with us. Uh, really not a new uh, think tank, the Center for Political and Democratic Reforms. Uh, this has been it's, uh, on since uh, eight, uh, 18 years ago, uh, although under another name, and it is now known as the Center for Political and Democratic Reform. Today we have uh, three um, experts on the Philippine baselines and issue. And our main speaker is Dr. Jay Batum who has been with us at the Department of National Defense and who has been, uh, in a matter of speaking, present at the creation. And Mahabo, uh, nakikita ko si Director Henry Bensurdo. Henry, ini-introduce na kita. Mamiya, introduce ko siya, pero let's welcome uh, Dr. Jay Batum Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here, very pleased to be here because I've been talking about uh, baselines and maritime zones and maritime limitations for quite a while. I think this is the first time that I've actually talked about it here, which is both good and bad. Um, good in the sense that um, it's an opportunity to reach a wider audience. Um, and talk with people who are not of the uh, but who are not of the legal mindset, no? Because uh, well, I'm a lawyer, have been for quite a while, and maritime boundaries, maritime issues have largely been uh, a highly judicialized uh, discourse. I mean, it's all they're always talking about laws, rules, regulations, international law, international treaties, conventions, etc., etc., etc. As long as there is a rule or principle involved, and that means that it's basically been lawyers who have been, who have been talking about this, while the rest of the people, the rest of non-lawyers have been basically onlookers, who unfortunately may not have, may, may well, tend to misunderstand what they hear, between, uh, the, uh, what they hear from the lawyers, because, well, how many of you are from the social sciences here? Social sciences, don't be afraid. It's not a disgraceful discipline. Uh, and how many are from the sciences? Applied sciences, college of science, engineering, mathematics. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Hola. Just one? Okay. Well, don't be ashamed either. You're probably going to need more money than the people from the social sciences. You have more opportunities actually um, not to discourage you from your current, from your current um, career choice. The um, thing is, um, you will be, if you're uh, from any discipline, whether it's anthropology or uh, biology, uh, you will have noticed by now uh, that you have a particular language, a particular set of jargon that you use, a particular set of words, discourses. Um, frames of reference that uh, you can buy as part of your training and education, such that the use of one word in one discipline might mean an entirely different thing in another. Okay? Um, so people who overhear lawyers talking about maritime boundaries are very prone to misunderstanding uh, what it is that they're talking about simply because they have no recourse but to apply what it is their, their own knowledge, their own perspective, their own understanding of the terms and concepts uh, to what they hear. And often that is the source of a lot of the problems, uh, a lot of the issues that come up. So, 
what makes this opportunity, this particular opportunity, a bit of a challenge, really, is to try to avoid that by bringing the uh, talk, the discourse, down to a more uh, generally acceptable, generally uh, understandable uh, uh, framework. Okay, and the best way I found to do that really was through a universal language, the language of Troy. Because in frustration, ko nung, nung, ano, undergrad, I wanted to go to fine arts, but I was told that there are fine arts. <coughs> of course, I'm not having there are fine arts. We could have been one of the first comic book artists uh, with a uh, well, famous as Anyway, again, next. So we will, uh, we will just talk about, uh, about this uh, in, in these topics. The development of the Philippine Manian boundaries, which I will show to you in imagery rather than than words, no? because um, you'd get bored to death if I just rattle off a whole bunch of uh, Republic Acts and, and numbers and other legal concepts and legal definitions. Uh, then we'll talk about current status and future changes. Um, we'll go into the meat of the discussion, which is the balancing of uh, interests. Um, and this, I think, is the discussion that, that we really need to have. Uh, both as uh, academics and as a people. You'll notice that the title, although the title of the seminar is Defining Baselines, uh, I have changed it a little and expanded on the topic. We will talk a little bit, take an example of a competition, in a sense, of, the, of international and national interests which necessarily arise whenever you talk about international maritime boundaries. After all, you're talking about what is the limit of your country's reach? Political science majors will be familiar with the four elements of the state, and this is precisely one of those elements, the territory. And then I would uh, conclude the talk actually with more questions, questions which I feel should be brought up and put out there into the public mind as, a, as the focal points for discussion, a discussion which needs to be undertaken right now because it has been put off for too long, okay? Now, Philippine Maritime Boundaries. Normally, when you talk about Philippine Maritime Boundaries, I hope that you did because when I took my political science course here, you know, the four I attended here, at a time when uh, student activism was high and very nationalistic, talking about anti-imperialist advocacies, uh, uh, Never did we have any discussion about precisely what is the boundary or the limits of the Philippines. I don't know if you had that discussion. Maybe you have since it came up in the paper <coughs> state. Okay. Now, the question that immediately comes to mind is whether, uh, no, I'm sorry. The, the, the reason why I put this up immediately is the fact is that we need to ask ourselves whether we're talking about simply lines on the map, which seems to be, which appears to be what happens most of the time when you when this issue crops up, especially in the papers. Uh, they're talking really about lines on the map. When you talk with legislators, when you look at proposed legislation, it's all about lines on the map. People drawing, drawing, drawing lines this way or that. And Yet, these lines become so hotly debated because once you draw a line a particular way, people start you know, getting all hysterical, you're giving up the national interest, etc., etc., without really defining very clearly what and how that national interest, if ever it is actually <laughs> specified, uh, is affected. Okay? Now, so you could look at it that way. That this is simply because of people in Congress or in, in government having an argument over where a line should be you know, on a map. Or you could look at it as an area of participation in the social imaginary for philosophers who might be familiar, uh, philosophy makers who might be familiar with the words of Charles Taylor, and, 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 and I think social imaginary is basically an extension or it builds upon the imagined communities of Benedict Anderson. The social imaginary is simple. But as the term connotes, is the way that we as a people imagine our societies to be, the way we construct uh, the Philippines as a state, as a nation. And one of the aspects of that social imaginary, as I 
family is the way you think about your country's territory. Most of the time, people again associate it with simply drawing the lines, lines on a map. You know, homogeneous body of area where this is our national territory. But as you find out later, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Okay. Now, this is a this this idea of Philippine maritime boundaries because as an archipelago our boundaries necessarily are maritime. We try to extend it beyond our our land. No, and we have recognized historically that there is something about our land and waters which connects them integrally. What it is exactly, apparently, people haven't really thought about it that far. All that they know is, all that they believe is that this is all one big lump called the Philippines, whether it's land or water. Okay. Now, the boundaries themselves, however, the nature, the, the nature, the location, the precise uh, definition, the precise effect is really peripheral to the knowledge of the average Filipino. Who, can, who here can tell me the coordinates of the three of Paris boundaries? Um, it's very peripheral. All we know, know is that well, there was this treaty of Paris. And then, and yet, despite this being this peripheral nature, no, it's actually fundamental to the mode to the manifestation in the mode of allocation of resources and power, both within the country and between the country and the rest of the international community, the rest of the world. It's, it's, it's really interesting how something so you know, unknown or misunderstood can be so important. Now, wait, wait, what's the next one? Next, next. Uh, bali, bali, bali. Now, so, the, we need to understand, really, uh, in order to come to start off this discussion, we need to understand, have a common understanding of how these boundaries came about. And that's why there's a need to go through its historical development. And you realize, as we go through it, you realize that this historical development has really been driven by colonial and post-colonial forces, both during the time that we were under the Americans and afterwards, and even up to the present. These influences are still there, even though we may not recognize them at all. In the past, we will also notice that in the past, there was an attempt to go against these forces, and certain actions that we did, that we took, were really part of a nationalist struggle, which was submerged, ultimately. But, Unfortunately, that nationalist struggle has not been recognized for what it is. An attempt to protect ourselves from an overwhelming tide of internationalism, which, unfortunately, uh, we do not seem to have recognized and for which we are not prepared. And the present, the question that we need to ask, therefore, is whether what we're doing, whether well, for whatever intention, good or bad, whether what they're doing is actually just a continuation of this, of this, uh, of this trend. Whether it's an Orientalist enterprise, meaning that we have now so in, imbibed the so-called internationalist perspective, the so-called global village, that we are now actually, well, we bought into it so much that we are actually sacrificing our own national uh, interests, our own national resources, for the sake of you know some the global operation of you know, uh, being part of being a member of the global community. 